I'm Julie Alexandria. And I'm Jennifer Mercedes. Between the two of us, we have over two decades of experience working in professional sports. We're telling the stories of women who are at the top of their game in sports and business. Welcome to the locker room. From D1 lacrosse player to the director of sponsorship sales for Spartan Race to VP of sales for the National Women's Soccer League to head of women's team sports at Octagon, Susie Petrowski has turned her lifelong love of sports into a career. Welcome to the show, Susie. It's so good to have you here. And congrats on so many things on your growing family and also to your latest position at Octagon. Wonderful to have you here in the locker room. Thank you. Couldn't be happier to be here. So excited to chat with you guys. So I want to go back to your D1 lacrosse playing days. What was something that you learned, something you took away from your experience playing D1 sports that you still apply to your life, your business, your relationships, your friendships today? Oh, my goodness. I I think playing sports, obviously, it's a bit of a cliche within our industry, but um, playing sports has defined the person I am, certainly in kind of being on time. If you're on time, you're late, you know, being early, respecting people's time, being a team player. But I think most significant for me was overcoming adversity, realizing that not everything, be it injury, be it change in personnel, um, circumstance, whatever, um, how you respond to that, how you react to that, how you allow that to impact your future decision making, that to me has been the most significant Um, I I guess, mm, I'm not quite sure the right word for it, but the most significant impact on my life has certainly been my participation in sports. And, you know, from a collegiate level, that's the highest level you can compete at. And um, I draw upon my experience on a daily basis. And as you mentioned, I'm bringing a child into this world very soon. And I I very much hope that uh, she is an athlete. It's kind of a joke in my family that if she is not, we're going to have to talk about a few things. But (laughs) she can be whatever she wants. But I I certainly hope it's an athlete. (laughs) Now, so many young women have dreams of working in sports. Can you take us through your journey and how you were able to turn your dream into a reality? Yeah, I I think, you know, first and foremost, it's incredibly important to acknowledge my privilege. Um, The sports industry is one that you come out, you don't, get paid very much. You have to hustle, you have to grind. And my privilege and the support of my family allowed me to pursue a career in sports. So I always like to highlight that because we need to make the sports industry accessible for black, brown, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, Asian Americans, trans community, et cetera. So first and foremost, I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Um, And the second piece of it, honestly, nothing else interests me. Um, and I, uh, if I'm, if I like something, if I'm focused on it, uh, I can do it forever. And if not, it's got a very short shelf life with me. So it kind of started, I went to a Giants game, uh, New York football Giants, huge fan, went with my dad. And while, of course, I was watching the competition on the field, I was looking around at all the signs and I was saying, you know, why do they get that sign there? Why is that one bigger than the other one? Um, and really that kind of prompted my interest in the business side of sport and, you know, anybody who would give me a shot, uh, I, you know, push my way in through that door. So it was a lot of persistence and also certainly a lot of privilege. And as a player yourself, you understand the challenges when it comes to women team sports. What are some of the biggest hurdles that you see that women athletes, female athletes, female identifying athletes are facing today? I mean, it's kind of chicken and the egg from my perspective. So there's a couple different things. Certainly from a media rights perspective, accessibility to sport is incredibly important. And oftentimes, of course, people call on the uh, lesser amount of revenue that's generated by women's sports. But how often is that attributed to a lack of visibility? If you need to go and you need to make those incredible partnerships that now exist with the WNBA, the NWSL, NWSL is where my experience has lied. Um, But it's still difficult to find all of those games. So I think a lot of these women are faced with the challenges of not uh, being on TVs readily accessible every single day. I think it's really important for us to start holding sponsors accountable. I think if they're going to invest in women's sport, 
Um, oftentimes there's a lot of justification as why that investment level is lower. Some of it valid, some of it not valid. We need to take into consideration the intangibles that come with an investment in women's sports. So, um, and then just general perception, misogyny. I think, you know, you look at any live or, or something on Instagram, whatever it might be, and there's two WNBA athletes talking. How many comments are about staying in the kitchen or all of these ridiculous antiquated perceptions? Um, that just scratches the surface. You know, I think just general infrastructure is also very important. Not all teams, not our leagues are all, all leagues are created equally. So also acknowledging that support can come in different ways. Yes, it needs to be in media rights dollars. Yes, it needs to be in sponsorship dollars. But also, it looks like supporting infrastructure growth even at the ground floor level. Such a good point. I mean, when everything went down with the men's versus the women's team during the NCAA championship March Madness this past year, and someone had put up on Instagram two photos side by side of the men's basketball swag bag and the women's basketball swag bag. And I retweeted the picture and I called out every single one of those brands from Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Dove, Mitchum, all of those brands. And I said, how could you give to one and not to the other? And you mentioned holding brands accountable because there is so much money in brands partnership, partnerships and corporate sponsorships. How do we begin to hold brands accountable? How do we get them to understand the inequities and the lack of equality and treatment when it comes to men and women's sports. You bring up a great point. I, I think why that, re that moment resonated so significantly across the country, across the world, we'll say, it was super tangible. You were able to see the differences. It was so obvious no one could deny it. So I think that tangibility of that moment, I've really called upon in a number of my conversations with other brand partners, many of whom I have phenomenal relationships with, and they got to see it and there was no denying it. So the more that we can elevate those tangible moments, no one can, can um, disagree with how obvious and evident the disparity is. So I, I think from an accountability standpoint, it's having these conversations. I am at an agency, a part of our agency certainly works with some of the best brands in the world. And I think us at Octagon, I'm not gonna toot our own horn too much, um, but we ideally want to become the destination for women's sport. And we are challenging ourselves to take into consideration some of those, like I said, intangible metrics. So. You know, some of it is hard conversations. Some of it is saying you have to buy in and there's not going to be a CPM assigned to it. So some of it is really bucking against the traditional nature of some of these decisions that are made with investment. Um, and it's kind of going to get decision makers to take a risk and buy in and say, I believe in this. I believe in the growth. I'm going to support you at the ground level even if those dollars aren't specifically tied to an asset that I can go put through my black box to decide what the value is. So uh, it's a complicated conversation, but it's going to take everyone in this industry checking themselves to say, are we gonna be part of the solution or are we going to keep perpetuating what's been the standard forever? Now, it's interesting because, right, it's a complicated conversation, but when those pictures came out, when we saw the disparity, the next day, everything was fixed. Yes. So it's not for lack of funds, it's just for lack of being aware and actually holding themselves accountable, right? Like, just like you said, it, it, it it's a complicated conversation, but really, it ain't that, you know, it's not that hard. All right, guys, but anyways. No, you're right, and, and I always like to call that out because there were a couple things. One, there were, non-traditional sponsors that acted very quickly or yeah. in theory, et cetera, you know, more boutique or emerging brands. And they acted very quickly and it was phenomenal from a PR perspective for them, right? So it's there, it's visible. I'm hopeful that we can create more transparency. Oftentimes within women's sport, there's a lot of posturing, rightfully so, to say, you know, we're doing great. And yes, women's sport is absolutely improving, but I also think it's important to say, we're doing great, but this is where we still kind of suck. This is where we don't have a lot of support. Brands, how can you help us? Yes, we want those sponsorship dollars, but there's also other ways that you can elevate women's sport. Now, there's no one true path or recipe for success when it comes to making it in the world of sports business, but what are some of the key things young people can do to set themselves on a path to success um, in the sports industry? 
So everyone's going to say networking. I say that with an asterisk. So for me, networking is not just reaching out to someone when you want a job, right? And that's great. Everyone you're talking to probably knows you're looking for a job. That, that's obvious. What I always say is, and where I found success was, I found a few people that I was like, I want your job one day. Tell me what you do every day. I'm going to stay top of mind, even if I'm kind of a pain in the ass. And I think finding those people that you want to learn from, um, staying in touch with them, going out of your way. I drove once. I remember I drove to a WISE event from my home in southeastern Connecticut, so not near New York, to at the time it was the Meadowlands. And I went and I couldn't get into this event. It was like for established people in the industry and I turned my ass around and I drove back home with my dad. But I think early in your career, it's about finding opportunity, finding people that might take a little bit of a chance on you and making sure they remember your name. And yeah. that's how you differentiate yourself from just a resume or a face in the crowd. Show that you're a little bit different. Yeah, show up. Uh, it's. It, I mean, it's something that I that I can relate to, and I'm sure Julie can as well, especially early on in your career. Show up wherever you can, wherever they will let you in. Um, show up because people take notice. I mean, I remember in the beginning of my career, people were like, "Jen, you're everywhere," and it was like, "Yeah," because I I need to be, you know, in order to to establish that that base and the respect that that we all have now. The beginning, you gotta the grind is real. You know, the hustle is real. But what what is some of the best advice that you received? Oh God, reputation is everything. All you have is who you are. Remember where you came from. Um, those are all things that my dad and, and my family has always told me. And I think now, you know, people want to do business with people they like. I try to live as authentically as I can. And I know that's like kind of a cliche word, but I'm the exact same person I am at home with my friends as I am in the workplace. And I think if you ask most people, if they hear my name, I'm hopeful that they say, you know, she's a good egg. Oh, we couldn't get something done with them, but she's kind. She's nice. She has a great reputation of doing the right thing. That to me is everything. All of this melts away. We've seen it with the pandemic, how many people are affected. We've seen this with social injustice, predominantly affecting marginalized communities. All of it melts away, but all you have is your reputation and the type of human being you are. And like, it's easy to not yell at someone. It's easy to not snap at someone. If you have, are having that type of day, take a couple hours, right? What people will remember is your kindness. That's so true. They, I love the quote that people don't always remember what it is that you said, but they remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So important. Now, a few leagues, including Major League Baseball, have come out and said that they are making a concerted effort to hire more women in leadership roles in order to remedy the problematic behavior that we've seen that has become so prevalent. And do you see this as happening in real time? And what else can leagues do in general to hire women to bring in that talent and to elevate and promote them? It's a great question. Am I seeing it in real time? Somewhat. I think we have to kind of have this reckoning that leadership is disproportionately white, disproportionately male. And as yes, we are making small improvements. Certainly black and brown people are minorities in almost every room. And women certainly are still minorities in almost every room. And are you taking into consideration what the background of some of those women that you are hiring? Have they traditionally been in a position that elevated um, the most uh, prevalent perspectives, right? So um, I think what's most important, I touched on it a little bit, is the privilege it takes to break into this industry, right? My parents paid my rent for the first X years out of college. Not everyone has that ability. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to start from an education standpoint. I certainly didn't really know that you could pursue a career in sport for a really long time. Now go to kind of um, more underprivileged communities, I can guarantee that many only believe the, believe the only way to work in sport is to be a professional athlete, is to make it to the NBA, is to make it to the NFL. We need to start at a much younger level and educate people who oftentimes don't have an opportunity to see that there are a lot of different avenues you can pursue in sport. And that means leadership, whatever that looks like, going into schools, going into different districts, educating, 
middle school, high school, college. You don't just have to go to the most prevalent Ivy League school. We, we at Octagon are starting a, a direct path with HBCUs, which is phenomenal, but let's expand even beyond that. So I, I went a little bit on a tangent for that particular question, but yes, in order to change the makeup of what this industry looks like, we have to do it at every single level. And that absolutely is at the entry level, middle management, and certainly from a leadership perspective. Now, do you think that it's getting easier for women in sports right now? Um, it's a great question. It depends. Uh, easier? I'm not sure. Are men very overtly making questionable statements to women uh every single day maybe that's slightly improving sure there's more accountability in that respect um i think that a lot more people are prioritizing it's funny i, I had a conversation yesterday and someone said we're very bullish on women's sports what the does that mean i'm sorry <laughs> no it's okay what does that mean? What do you mean you're bullish on women's sports? <laughs> so for the entirety of your career, you haven't really had to acknowledge women's sports, but now because it's in your face, you're bullish on it. What does that mean? What are the tangible next steps to make you further invest to elevate women's sports? So there's conversation, certainly. Is that resulting in action and tangible change? We got a ways to go. We have to keep talking about it. We have to keep pushing it. We have to keep prioritizing different perspectives, different experiences. Yeah, and I, it, you mentioned misogyny before, but I don't know if you guys have followed on Twitter, but some guy fan, sports fan, um, said that you know he preferred a tone of voice that was much deeper for sports. That was his reasoning for not wanting to hear women talk about sports. And I had the same reaction you just had, like, what the f does that mean? <laughs> we also need to hold networks accountable. Why, when I'm watching baseball, am I predominantly only seeing men? Why am I only seeing women as sideline reporters in the NFL? I care about their perspective. I want to hear them breaking down and providing an analysis. I'm like an NFL draft nerd. I love it. I watch all seven rounds. It's ridiculous. Why is every person speaking? Why the only person I see is Susie Colbert who's doing the uh, interview when they step off the stage. Give me more female voices. Their perspective will be different. And, and, and if you get that one man that says, I want a deeper voice, I don't give a bro. I don't care. I love you so much for saying that. I've worked for networks my entire life for over a decade working um, for college football, for major networks, and also in Major League Baseball. And it was in 2008 when all of a sudden it was sort of the fad and it was in fashion to have a female sideline reporter and that was considered diversity. And, but it was limited just to having a, a quick injury report or something where you had to get it in under 90 seconds or 60 seconds if you were really good. <laughs> <laughs> so we could hear the guys talking again. And that is such a huge problem. And thank you for bringing that up because I am ready to see that day. I am so ready to see that day where women are not just relegated to the sidelines and quick hits. Um, Really quick, let's end it on a on a positive note. What is the best thing that you have seen from women's sports lately? Oh, my goodness. Look at how the WNBA, the NWSL, the U.S. Women's National Team have used their voice for social justice. The NBA has done an incredible job in supporting, you know, social justice, social responsibility. Um, everyone can say stick to sports till you're blue in the face. But until this country acknowledges that black and brown and gay and trans and Asian people are treated differently than white people, um, we got a long way to go. So I think seeing how sports, especially women in sports, have been leaders in this space, unapologetically so, despite political narrative or partisan narrative, whatever it might be, that to me is reaffirming. That, when I bring my daughter into this world, that is what she is going to see. If I have a son, that is what my son will see. I don't care how you are born. I don't care who you love. Sports unites. Sports is what is best about this world. That's why I love it, live it every single day. The more we can use our privilege, the more we can use our voice to help people that have no opportunity to share that voice, the better we are. And sports does that for me. And I can't wait to see where else we're going with it. And you're doing one of the best things and it's acknowledging the privilege. 
Uh, I think that when we're able to acknowledge our own privilege, uh, we're able to help others because we can see where we've been helped and where others have, have lacked. So thank you so much for being on here with us. And I'm sorry if I seemed a little distracted at times, just because, you know, virtual life, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of moving some stuff and they decided to come literally as we're doing this interview. There's what's coming. <laughs> oh my God, I'm surprised I got to jump on my lap. I, I mean, I can't tell you, we're living in it. It's the new world. Hopefully it allows people to share a little bit more empathy. We're all doing it, all good. <laughs> So true. Susie, you are wonderful. I wish I could wake up every morning hearing you preach because everything you have said, I couldn't agree more. And it absolutely goes into the ethos of what Locker Room is. So thank you for being here. Thank you for coming on the show and speaking with us. And where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they hear more? Oh, God. I mean, I'm on Instagram. It's mostly me and my wife and my sneakers. I'm a huge sneakerhead at Suzy P-O, S-U-S-I-E-P-I-O. Um, Going to have some baby content soon. Uh, who doesn't love that, right? I'm sure everyone <laughs> has too much of that on your content. But baby's going to have fire sneaker heat. So you can tune in for that. <laughs> we are excited. Some new, some fresh drop. We can't wait. Suzy, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Get used to being uncomfortable. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable because you will be so uncomfortable through this journey of going and being a sports reporter, but it is at completely possible.